Good evening. Good to see you all tonight. Let me adjust my light here to a better angle. And uh, it's good to be with you. Let's turn in God's word, please, to Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19. We do appreciate your prayers and thankful for all that the Lord is doing and to hear about some others that we know in common that we can pray for, some things we didn't know about. So I'm always glad to be part of your prayer meeting as well. Uh, I'm also, by way of prayer request, trying to write a couple of articles this week, and I'd appreciate prayer for wisdom and how to put that together. So I'm uh, writing one on deadline, and the other is not on deadline, so I have a little more leeway, but uh, one I definitely have to get finished by the end of the week, so please pray that comes off well. Acts chapter 19, verse 1. And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus and finding some disciples, he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to him, we have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said unto them, into what then were you baptized? And they said, into John's baptism. Then Paul said, John indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Now the men were about 12 in all. And he went into the synagogue and spoke boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of God. But when some were hardened and did not believe, but spoke evil of the way before the multitude, he departed from them and withdrew the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. And this continued for two years, so that all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. I want to talk to you tonight about God working behind the scenes, God working behind the scenes. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, we can look around at world events and we see many things that the scriptures tell us will happen in the last days. The Lord Jesus, for example, said that there would be wars and rumors of wars before the coming of the Son of Man. And we certainly see that in, in our century, in the past hundred years, there's been a lot of that. But there's no sign of it abating. In fact, it seems to be increasing that we have more and more conflict on the planet. And so many things going on. If we just looked at the news cycle, we could get very disheartened at the state of the world. And yet we have to remember that our hope is not in this world. Our hope is in heaven. Our hope and our life itself is bound up with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what Colossians 3 talks about that we are dead and our life is hidden with Christ and God. So as believers, we're not looking for this world to be the end of the journey or this world to be paradise. We're looking for that kingdom that's going to come. We're looking for the Lord to take the church to himself and to present his bride without spot or blemish or any such thing. And as we go through Acts 19, we see that there was really a spiritual warfare going on behind the scenes and it manifested itself in certain events that happened in this chapter now it's interesting at the beginning that we have a transition between something that god had done formerly and now god bringing people into the church age and what i mean by that is paul encounters this group of 12 men who were disciples of john the baptist but apparently had not heard anything beyond his teaching and preaching. And that certainly was a great ministry. The Lord Jesus said, among those born of woman, there had not risen one greater than John the Baptist. And he was the last of the prophets of the Old Testament age. And yet the Lord was now doing something new. He said, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And so we have now a transition. We have something new that's come even though this group didn't appreciate it. Now, our chapter divisions sometimes obscure connections, and it's the case here that in chapter 18, at the end of the chapter, we have someone else who is brought from partial knowledge of the gospel 
to full knowledge of the gospel, namely this man, Apollos, who was there at Ephesus, and he's, uh, he encounters Aquila and Priscilla. And so he is a, a great preacher, a zealous man. We read in chapter 18, verse 24, it says a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures came to Ephesus. So he was from the university city of Alexandria. This was the location of one of the ancient wonders of the world. And that was the great library that they had had there formerly. And it says about him in verse 25, this man had been instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in spirit, he spake and taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he only knew the baptism of John. So much like these men that Paul runs into here in Ephesus, uh, which is on near the coast there in Turkey, uh, in our modern times, the city now is called Ephes, and it's not too far from the modern city of Selchuk. And uh, some years ago, Naomi and I got to visit there briefly and tour around some of the ruins. But as Paul came there, he found these people that didn't know anything beyond the baptism of John the Baptist. And it was the same with this young man, Apollos. But you see what Aquila and Priscilla did for him in verse 26. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And after that, he goes over to the region of Achaia, one of the sections of Greece, and ends up at Corinth and uh, other places later on. But in any case, uh, there had to be a further instruction. And he's not the first person in the book of Acts either. I mean, we have the Jews in the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, <coughs> pardon me, who, of course, know the messianic prophecies. They know the feasts that the Lord gave them, but they don't know that God has now raised up Jesus and made him both Lord and Christ. Later in Acts chapter 8, we have the Samaritans who have to be enlightened further with the gospel. And initially, Philip the evangelist goes and preaches among them, and the disciples come down from Jerusalem and lay their hands on them. And then Cornelius in Acts chapter 10, a Gentile who knew about Judaism, who knew about the true and living God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but who didn't know about the Lord Jesus Christ. And he was responding to the light he had, and so the Lord gave him more light, and he heard about the Lord Jesus, and as he and his family and friends heard about the Lord Jesus, they believed, and the Holy Spirit came upon them in a dramatic uh, fashion with outward signs to show it was occurring. And the same thing happens here in chapter 19, that these people who didn't know about the Lord Jesus Christ now are told what Paul Harvey would have called the rest of the story. They now hear the full gospel, that it's not just repent and get ready for Messiah because he's coming soon. They now hear Messiah has come. Messiah has died on the cross. Messiah has risen again from the dead. And he has ascended up on high, having led captivity captive. He has sent forth the promise of the Father, what the Father promised to give, and that is the Holy Spirit. And on believing this message and showing that by being baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, this group of disciples was then given the Holy Spirit. Now, we should be careful because <clears throat> today people kind of come to their Bibles and they read them too quickly and in some cases too shallowly. And there are some believers that come to the book of Acts and they think, well, this is how you get the Holy Spirit. You know, first you get saved by believing on the Lord Jesus. And then later at some subsequent time, you have to receive the Holy Spirit. Well, no, the pattern for us is more what we see in Acts chapter 10 with Cornelius and his friends, those Gentile believers, that when they believed on the Lord Jesus, they received the Holy Spirit. In other words, when the Lord came to dwell within them, he brought his spirit with him. It was what the Lord Jesus spoke about in John 14 when he said, the Father and I will come and make our abode with you. We don't have to wait, and the epistles do not teach that we have to ask to receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit 
comes upon all those who believe. In fact, Romans 8, 9 says, if any man have not the spirit of God, he is none of his. So the Holy Spirit is part of the gospel. He comes to indwell the believer as part of the good news, as part of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, that the Lord Jesus not only died to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself, not only died to declare us righteous, to justify us in the legal courts of heaven, so to speak, to give us a forensic righteousness, not only did he come to make us holy, all those things are true, but he came to give us new life by the Holy Spirit, to be born again by the Spirit of God, and made new creatures in Christ Jesus. And this is exactly what we see here with these disciples at the beginning of Acts chapter 19. Now, after that, it's interesting, there were 12 of them. So this is a little bit like a, a bookend of the coming of the Holy Spirit. In Acts 2, when he was initially poured out, he came upon 12 men. You remember, they were the 12 apostles selected by the Lord Jesus. And now these men are also 12 men. And it's almost like literarily speaking, this is kind of marked off in the book of Acts. Like, okay, now this is all the different categories of people we've seen as they receive this new gospel, this message of the Lord Jesus Christ that wasn't revealed previously, but now is made known, they receive the Holy Spirit. So we have Israel receiving it, the Jews receiving it. In Acts chapter two, they receive the Holy Spirit. We have the Samaritans receiving him in Acts chapter 8. We have the Gentiles receiving him in Acts chapter 10. And here in Acts chapter 19, we have the disciples of John receiving the Holy Spirit. Now, the result is interesting that almost immediately there's a conflict. And this always happens. Wherever God is working, Satan is also working. And so we read in verse 8. He went into the synagogue and spoke boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of God. Now, the preaching of the early apostles in the early chapters of Acts was also marked by boldness. And they prayed for boldness. They prayed for the Lord to empower them, that they would boldly speak the word, that they wouldn't back down, so to speak, that they would clearly and uh, with passion enunciated in an understandable way. And you notice they were reasoning, they were appealing to people's minds. This wasn't just trying to stir the emotions to a shallow commitment. And they were persuading them. So they were, there was an exhortation toward the people. It wasn't just like, well, here's the gospel story, now make up your own mind. No, they were urging people to repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. But it, we look at verse 9, and it says, when some were hardened and did not believe, but spoke evil of the way before the multitude, he departed from them and withdrew the disciples. Now, that encourages me. You say, why does it encourage you, Keith? I mean, that's kind of depressing that these people hardened themselves and didn't believe. Indeed, it is. It's always sad when somebody rejects the gospel message, but it shows me that if people rejected the message when it came from Paul, an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, empowered by his spirit, who was boldly reasoning and persuading concerning the kingdom of God, if he gave the message, obviously, clearly and accurately, <coughs> pardon me, and they didn't receive it, then I shouldn't feel bad if I give the message and they don't receive it from me either. Don't get me wrong. We want to keep giving the message. We want to do what 2 Timothy 4 says, be instant in season and out of season. In other words, when you have fruit, when you don't have fruit, when it seems auspicious, when it seems inauspicious, when it's convenient, when it's not convenient, we still need to preach the word. That's our mandate as Christians. That's what the church is to do. And so I'm not saying we stop preaching the word. But, you know, even when the Lord Jesus preached, there were many people that did not believe. <clears throat> and when Peter and John and the other apostles and now Paul preached, it was the same sort of thing. There were some who hardened themselves and did not believe, uh, but they spoke evil of the way before the multitude. And so he departed from them and withdrew the disciples. This is an instance of what the Lord Jesus talked about in the Sermon on the Mount. 
when he spoke about not casting our pearls before swine. Now we have to be careful because we can't read people's hearts. And uh, I'm not saying again that we want to stop witnessing to people, but there comes a certain point when you've explained it as clearly as you know how, when you have urged them as the spirit has led you to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and they're not ready at that moment. They don't want to believe it. Either they're they're hardened like these people were they're obdurate they they are adversarial they don't want to receive it maybe they're angry and antagonistic or maybe they merely just don't understand at that point in time we have to remember we're just planting seeds paul would say i planted apollos watered but god gave the increase in first corinthians and so this is how it works we're a link in the chain i used to have a friend who was a passionate evangelist he's now with the lord but he would get visibly saddened and almost depressed if people didn't believe when he witnessed to them <coughs> excuse me and i used to say to him brother you might just be a link in the chain your job is to preach the word your job is to sow the seed you let the lord bring the increase as much as we may want to, we can't make anyone believe. We can't force them. And we want to be as persuasive and as reasonable as possible. We want to be uh, tools in the hand of the Holy Spirit to accurately get the word to people. But at the end of the day, this is between a soul and God. And we can't get in the way of that. And many times when people have been overzealous, no doubt well-meaning and well-intentioned, but they want so badly to see somebody believe they can put words in their mouth. And that's very dangerous to do. It's better to give them the truth as clearly as you can, and then to back off and let the Lord work on them. Now, Paul took the, those who had believed away to a rented facility, we might call it the school of Tyrannus that we read about here in verse nine. And so for two years, he's there. Uh, preaching and teaching in that location and so it says verse 10 this continued for two years so that all who dwelled in asia heard the word of the lord jesus both jews and greeks so rather than this opposition stop the preaching or make paul cowed and fearful and oh i better soft pedal it or i better back off and retrench no he would remove himself from preaching in the synagogue but he wouldn't stop preaching. He'd go elsewhere and preach. And obviously the word was getting out. This verse that talks about um, those in Asia hearing the word, <coughs> excuse me, it reminds me of something that's said over in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Turn with me to 1 Thessalonians 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. I've had this cough for about two months, so you can pray for me. Uh, specifically since about December 19th, and I am on cough medicine and using cough drops, and it just doesn't go away, so appreciate prayer for that. But First Thessalonians chapter 1, he says in verse 5, for our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power, and in the Holy Spirit, and in much assurance, as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. And you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Pardon me, verse seven. So that you became examples to all in Macedonia and Achaia who believe. For from you, the word of the Lord has sounded forth, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith toward God has gone out so that we do not need to say anything. So imagine as word was spreading, the news, the testimony of what had happened to the Thessalonians, how they received the word in much affliction. They had to suffer for it. They were persecuted. They had it difficult, but they also received it in joy of the Holy Spirit. The Lord encouraged them and strengthened them in heart. And from them, therefore, the word sounded out to Macedonia and Achaia and in every place so that Paul said, we don't need to say anything. Now we come back to Acts 19. <clears throat> Acts 19 verse 11. <clears throat> I'll take a drink here. Acts 
Acts 1911. And it says, now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick and the diseases left them. <coughs> Pardon me, and the evil spirits went out of them. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, we exercise you by Jesus whom Paul preaches, by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. Also, there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, who did so. And the evil priest answered and said, excuse me, and the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? Then the men then the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overpowered them, and prevailed against them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. This became known both to all Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus, and fear fell on them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus, <coughs> pardon me, the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. Time for another cough drop. And many who had believed, came confessing and telling their deeds. <clears throat> also, many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all, and they counted up the value of them, and it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. So this is one of the things I mean when I say about looking behind the scenes. Because on the one level, we might say, well, here there was human opposition in Ephesus. There were people who hardened themselves against the message. <clears throat> and that led them to speak evil of the way. They criticized the apostles. They denied the gospel. They attacked the truth. And so we might say, well, here are these wicked men who are doing this thing. But we realize behind them, there are evil spiritual powers. There are these evil beings that the Bible calls evil spirits or demons, unclean spirits. They're also known as frequently in the Gospels. And it reminds me of a cross-reference in Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 6. <coughs> Pardon me. Ephesians 6. And verse 10, Ephesians 6 and verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenlies. <laughs> <coughs> pardon me so it's explicitly said here we're not wrestling against flesh and blood against human beings in other words yes there are humans that speak against the truth yes there are people that argue with us there are people that deny the lord jesus christ and his gospel but behind them there are <coughs> <coughs> pardon me behind them there are spiritual beings who are blinding their minds and deluding them and so uh, we have to realize the nature of the conflict now it's brought out very visibly and not only by the miracles paul was doing by the holy spirit but there were others who were trying to imitate those miracles now miracles were something that was definitely linked with the apostolic age <laughs> <laughs> from the second century up to the present time the miracles have really lessened in tremendous degree i'm not saying god never does miracles uh, god is still the same all-powerful being and some of us have experienced uh, amazing interpositions of his power <laughs> either healing us um, in some cases or um, giving us wisdom that we didn't have in a certain situation. I mean, God works is what I'm trying to say. And sometimes that work is providential. Sometimes it's through natural means. And sometimes it can be through supernatural means. 
<coughs> Pardon me. I get warm when I speak, and that makes the problem worse. I'll try slowing down a little. I like to talk fast. And um, when my throat is irritated, that doesn't help me. Anyway, we have many people today that are charlatans that are trying to imitate the powers of the Holy Spirit, even in the point of taking handkerchiefs like Paul did here. <laughs> I'm saying that for a fee, if you if you send them money, they'll send you a prayer handkerchief and this will heal you. Well, these are nothing but scams, of course. <laughs> and the gift of healing, which was in effect at this time in the book of Acts, because it was a beginning of a new dispensation. And when you see the beginning of something new that hasn't happened before, as in the time when God raised up Moses and Aaron and Joshua, you did see miraculous things happening. Or when Elijah and Elisha were calling the nation back from apostasy, from full-blown unbelief, or in the days of the apostles, you see these miraculous things happening. But in our day, the Lord isn't doing these things through specific men as a regular gift. There isn't the gift of healing in operation today. Does God heal? Absolutely. But is the gift of healing operating like it operated in Acts? No. There aren't people that are healers. And certainly these people who set themselves up as faith healers, we have only to examine their doctrine, let alone their lifestyle, and it shows the fraudulent nature of what they're doing. Now, where the Holy Spirit is active, the devil will be active too. And these Jewish exorcists were going around proclaiming <laughs> <coughs> that they had power. And they remind us of other people earlier in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 8, Simon the sorcerer, for example, who offered Peter money that he could get the power to dispense the Holy Spirit at will. Well, the Holy Spirit isn't one who's going to be cooped up in a Coke machine, you know, and just insert money and you get the Holy Spirit. That's not how it works. The Holy Spirit is the gift of God. He is given to those who believe and receive the Lord Jesus Christ. <coughs> <coughs> <clears throat> and these men obviously didn't know the Lord Jesus because they said, I command you in the name of the Jesus whom Paul preaches. Now, does that sound like they knew him? Absolutely not. The Jesus whom Paul preaches. And the demons even say here, <clears throat> Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? See, the name of the Lord Jesus is not an abracadabra-like formula. It's not an incantation that we can use to get what we want. That whole name it and claim it mindset <coughs> that in parts of the world is so common today is so false. But instead of these men prevailing over the demon, the fact that they had a form of godliness but denied the power thereof, outwardly they appeared to be exorcists, but they didn't know the Lord. So they had no power in this spiritual contest. And so the man who was possessed by the evil spirit leapt on them, overpowered them, prevailed against them, and they fled the house naked and wounded. So we remember the Lord Jesus said that no man can despoil a strong man. You can't take a strong man's goods unless you first bind that strong man. And if you bind him, then you can despoil his whole house. But obviously these men had no power because they fled away wounded. And also they fled away naked. They were torn out of their very clothes, <laughs> which nakedness in the Bible speaks this side of the fall, at least, at least of shame. And so there wasn't any triumph for the glory of God. There wasn't any spiritual victory for the name of Christ here. <clears throat> and there was a revealing that these men were false and that they didn't have the power of God and they didn't understand the powers 
that they were messing with. Now, as the true gospel progressed through Ephesus, we see the dramatic effect it had in the community that many of the Jews and Greeks, <coughs> it says there that the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified in verse 17. And many who believed came confessing and telling their deeds. So the evidence of the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ and his power was changed lives. They came confessing that they were sinners. They came talking about what they had been saved from. And some of these were saved out of the occult. Verse 19 says, also many of these who practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted up the value of them and it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. Now, these books had secret information. You know, many times in history, uh, people were interested in alchemy. They were interested in manipulating substances, some by science and some by pseudoscience. <laughs> and they were interested in, for example, turning lead into gold or, or coming up with different cures and different potions. And these things are very ancient. They go back to the ancient world. And the archaeologists have found many tablets and many books that talk about spells and incantations and so forth. And people who had these powers, these, this secret knowledge, it was very valuable. They would pay a lot of money to get these books so that they could pronounce blessing or cursing or so that they could have spiritual power. So they thought. And 50,000 pieces of silver was an immense fortune. So imagine the reality of their repentance as these people were coming and saying, you know, we don't need these things anymore. We don't need the occult. The occult is defiling. When people mess with the spirit world, with demons and unclean spirits, it never goes well for human beings. We are not wise enough and canny enough to deal with those infernal beings that are very wise at tempting <coughs> and casting stumbling blocks in our way. And even Satan himself, 2 Corinthians says, is able to transform himself into an angel of light. <coughs> so we want to be very wary, even in talking about spiritual warfare, that we keep exactly to what the scriptures say, that we don't go following after this technique and that mantra and that formula to try and battle the devil and his legions that won't work for us we need the word of god and we see that's where the victory was in verse 20 it says the word of god grew mightily and prevailed now it says when these things were accomplished verse 21 paul purposed in the spirit when he had passed through macedonia and Achaia to go to jerusalem saying, after I have been there, I must also see Rome. So he went into Macedonia. Two of those who, <coughs> excuse me, he sent into Macedonia two of those who ministered to him, Timothy and Erastus, for he himself stayed in Asia for a time. And about that time, there arose a great commotion about the way for a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, who made silver shrines of a Diana, brought no small profit to the craftsmen. He called them together with the workers of similar occupation and said, you know that we have our prosperity by this trade. Moreover, you see and hear that not only at Ephesus, but throughout almost all Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away many people saying that they are not gods which are made with hands. So not only is this trade of ours in danger of falling into disrepute, but also the temple of the great goddess Diana may be despised and her magnificence destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worshipped. Now, this is a tremendous testimony coming from the enemies of the gospel. <coughs> and this man, Demetrius, who was representative of uh, the local idol shrine makers 101 union or something like that, he says, you know, our... Our livelihood is being damaged here by this message because so many are turning from idols to God. And that's exactly what happened in Thessalonica as well, doesn't it? When we read in 1 Thessalonians 1.9, 1 
<coughs> how it says they turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God um, <clears throat> and to wait for his son from heaven, even Jesus, whom he raised from the dead, who delivers us from the wrath to come. And this is the power of the gospel that as we preach Christ and people come to know the Lord, they're going to give up their idols. They're going to give up their false doctrines. You know, sometimes Christians can get so fixated on a certain issue. <coughs> and they can be very concerned about abortion or very concerned about evolution or very concerned about homosexuality and things like that. And, and no doubt these are sins that we decry, that we preach against and that we know are incompatible with a knowledge of God and his word. But at the same time, the focus of our message has to be preaching Christ. And when people come to Christ, he saves them out of that stuff. He saves them out of a life of immorality. He saves them out of manner and, and kinds of thinking that are wicked. And so it's a tremendous thing to preach Christ and to see the change that comes. <coughs> <clears throat> now, even though there was a lot of people coming to the Lord, we shouldn't think back and think, oh, it was all easy. Because as I said, whenever God is busy, the devil is going to push back. There's going to be satanic opposition. And even here, when this man gets up and gives that speech, a riot develops. They heard this and they were full of wrath, it says in verse 28 and cried out saying, great is Diana of the Ephesians. So the whole city was filled with confusion and rushed into the theater with one accord having seized Gaius and Aristarchus Macedonians, Paul's travel companions. And when Paul wanted to go into the people, the disciples would not allow him. Then some of the officials of Asia who were his friends sent to him pleading that he would not venture into the theater. Some therefore cried one thing and some another, for the assembly <coughs> was confused. <clears throat> and most of them did not know why they had come together. Now, the long and short of it is they were united in this only, that they hated the message they were hearing. They hated the gospel. They wanted to cling to their false ways. And so they were all enraged. <coughs> <clears throat> and they came together in an assembly. By the way, this is one of the few times in the New Testament where we get the word assembly being used of a secular gathering rather than of the church, rather than of a spiritual gathering of God's people. And it's interesting to contrast this assembly with the true church. These people were gathered together in confusion. The church is to be gathered together and do all things decently and in order, as 1 Corinthians 14 says. These people were gathered in opposition to Christ. The church is gathered unto the Lord Jesus Christ. He is our head, and he is in the midst of us. He walks in the midst of the lampstands, Revelation chapters 1 through 3 show us. And these people were confused. We're not confused. <clears throat> we come together enlightened, walking in truth, walking in the light as he is in the light. And the blood of Jesus Christ, God's son, cleanses us from all sin. So it's quite a contrast, the true assembly from the false one. But interestingly, whereas there was a riot developing, and it might have spilled over into violent persecution and to the killing of Christians, God providentially thwarted it through a bureaucrat. And I don't know about you, but I'm not fond of bureaucracy. But I'm glad for this town clerk, because <clears throat> he spoke up and quite rightly reminded the crowd that they were gathered together illegally. In other words, when you look at the book of Acts, it wasn't the Christians who were the rabble rousers and rebels. It was the people that opposed the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, he said, we're in danger to be charged because of this assembly. He says, if you have any other inquiry to make, it shall be determined in the lawful assembly in verse 39. So the implication is they weren't gathered together lawfully according to the Roman laws. <coughs> and so they were, were dispersed at this time. They weren't able to stop the truth. They weren't able to get rid of the church. And they weren't even able to kill any of the Christians at this time because the Lord said, 
hey, bureaucrat, go in there and remind them of the Roman law. And this man unknowingly, providentially was used in God's hand to affect peace and a detente in that city on that day. It's rather like Gamaliel back in chapter five, who when the Sanhedrin is livid and entirely put out with Peter and John, <coughs> Gamaliel gets up and says, now, wait a minute. If you do something to these men, um, you might be found to be fighting against God. You know, there are other people that rose up and said they were Messiah and it came to nothing. So you should keep your hands off these men and leave them alone. And God used that to protect them. <coughs> well, brothers and sisters, the moral of the story is for all the things we see happening with Republicans and Democrats, with what's going on up in Canada, with Russia and Ukraine, with all the other things happening around the world, this is just the tip of the iceberg because underneath there are spiritual forces battling. And guess who's on the winner's side? We are because the Lord Jesus has already triumphed and triumphed gloriously. So what we need to do is just what these dear believers did here. We need to cling to the Lord Jesus, prayerfully and boldly serve him and keep preaching his word. May God help us to do so. And again, I apologize for my voice. Thank you very much.